scriptures and, and found real clear in the book of Romans that uh, we've all fallen short. And that is that we've come short of God's glory. We come short of God's righteousness. We've all sinned. And according to verse 19, uh, our mouths are stopped and we're guilty before God. But in verse 21, there is an exception that's being offered, uh, a remedy in our behalf. And it doesn't have to do with our righteousness. It has to do with God's righteousness that is manifest. And manifest means made known. And what's made known about God's righteousness is that it is available to people today. That God's righteousness is attainable and it's provided by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is, there's a provision made for us through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to be found righteous in God's sight. And, and in such righteousness is to be found in God's righteousness itself. So verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. They had said there was going to be a time that Israel would be clothed with righteousness. But Paul's writing to us Gentiles as well as lost Jews of this age and telling us that, that all of us can be found righteous in God today by the grace of God. And that's why it says in verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, everyone who has come short, that that righteousness is unto all and upon all them that believe. And the reason that's unto all and upon all them that believe is because there's no difference between all of us. <laughs> Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God's righteousness in this age of grace is not just promised to Israel as witnessed in the Law and the Prophets, but it's available to everyone. That God's righteousness is unto all. But it's, a, it's only on or upon, as it says, them that believe. So the availability of all men to be found righteous before God is, is provided through Jesus Christ. It's all by the faith of Jesus Christ, or as we learned how to express that thought, it's by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. His his coming into this world, His living an absolutely perfect life, His willingness to go to the cross and die on the cross to be the payment for our sins, and His resurrection, trusting God to raise Him from the dead, that His, his faithfulness, His death, burial, and resurrection became the means by which God's righteousness is unto everybody, available to everybody, but only upon those that believe, because it's when you believe that God declares you righteous. Uh, and it's available to everybody because we live in a time where all have sinned and came short. So we began to look at verse 24 and, and real, realized in the detail that's in this verse. And I told you that we'd only start on it last week and we'll work on it this week and hopefully finish the verse this week. Uh, a verse that just simply just lays it out. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And, and it's not done. There's more things he has to say about Christ uh, in the next verse, but, but just taking verse 24 and realizing what it's offering us. I want you to see the connection, and, and it's helpful for me. And by the way, it was when I was a teenager at Grace Bible Church that a man came up, and before the sermon, back when we used to have the, the time where we had the Scripture reading, that he chose to stand up and give just a definition. And he went to Romans chapter 3, and he started picking these words out and just giving a five-minute definition, and he'd sit down. He wasn't the pastor. He's one of the elders of the church. And he just started doing that every Sunday until he defined all the terms that we use when we talk about the gospel or being saved or the cross work of Christ. And I remember as a teenager going, oh, that's what that means. I mean, you always hear about justification. That's one of the words we're going to talk about today. And, uh, and you hear about, uh, you know, righteousness or redemption or propitiation that's going to be found in the next verse. And you're a little bit familiar with it because you know it has to do with Christ dying, but you're not absolutely familiar with it in the sense that you don't know technically what the word means. And when he explained what those words mean, he grounded me in my understanding of the gospel. And uh, so years ago, we, we uh, were teaching the book of Romans on a Wednesday. And uh, we had in, in just a small group on Wednesday, but some people that have been in the Bible, say for years, but up in age. And we went through and defined these terms, and the next thing I find out is these ladies, particularly, that were up in age, have now so clearly understood the gospel that they're witnessing to the gas man when he came in the door. And uh, that, when you really understand something, then you can explain it to someone else. And, uh, and so as time went on and we studied the same things in Grace School of the Bible that the students wrote uh, and gave a little message, a five-minute message before the service, 
uh, about these definitions, these words, and I assigned different ones to come and give that definition. While they were doing that, I was writing them and putting them down in the, in the bulletin. And, uh, and then we had an elders meeting, Roy Smith, we were talking about making it a booklet, and Roy Smith said, uh, why, why don't we make this a book? And uh, by the book back there called Dictionary of the Gospel is the very verse that we're studying, the very passage that we're studying here. It's these words just simply defined, and uh, it has gone out, and, and it, it's just the clarification of understanding these words that help you appreciate the gospel that's caused that book to go so many different countries of the world and, and been translated into many different languages. And uh, Sanjay just informed me that we're down to the last case, and when we get them reprinted again, we'll be up to the 10,000 copy coming out uh, on the next printing. And uh, so the ch church has distributed quite a few. I say that to you so that if you want to study this a little further, there's a book back there, Dictionary of the Gospel, that will help you understand these things. But uh, we're studying them together here, and, uh, and the, the importance of these words will help understand the gospel. When you look at verse 24, and it says, being justified freely by his grace, uh, it, it kind of like jumps. When you're reading verse 22, you're reading about even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. And then it kind of changes subjects from believing to the failures of mankind by saying, for there, for, uh, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then you go back to what happens when you believe in verse 24. So that when, when it gets a little choppy in your reading, if you'll just clarify in your own mind that when you're reading verse 22 and it talks about that God's righteousness is upon all them that believe, verse 24 is explaining what happens when a person believes and so that you would understand how God's righteousness is upon the believer. So verse 24, it would actually be like, uh, uh, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And what we did last week is we started looking at that, those, that phrase of how we can, God's righteousness is upon the believer, and in verse 24, in realizing, and we, we started going backwards through the verse, realizing, first of all, that it is in Christ Jesus. That's been the emphasis of the chapter. It's not in you to be found righteous. Righteousness is found in Christ Jesus. In the very order of his name, Christ be put, being put before Jesus, is reminding you is that Christ is God's anointed one who is Jesus the Savior, trying to get you to see that's God's anointed Savior for you. And, uh, and that you're, uh, you being found righteous before God is not in you, it's in Christ Jesus. The way that it's in Christ Jesus is what it said prior to that in verse 24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus did something for you that can cause you to be found righteous before God, and what he did, it's through the redemption that's in Christ that you can be declared righteous freely in God's sight. Uh, the redemption that's in Christ, redemption speaks about payment, paying a price. Especially in Bible days, it speaks particularly about being freed from slavery. And um, we, we already read in verse 23 that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We, we're enslaved to sin. Uh, we're, we're, as it says over in chap, uh, chapter 3 and verse 9, that we are all under sin. That is, under the dominion and the reign of sin, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and therefore sin reigns over us, and that the wages of our sin, Romans 6, verse 23, says, for the wages, the payment, you, you've earned something by your sins, and you want paid off, here's the payment for your sin. For the wages of sin is death. And so there is a payment for being under sin. And uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 14, where Paul says, I am carnal, sold under sin. You have sold yourself by sinning to be under the dominion of sin, and the end of, God, of the dominion of sin is death. And death is separation from God. To die in your sins is to be eternally separated from God. And that's what we're under. We're sold under sin. We're sold in that dilemma, and you can't pay your way out. Because you're a sinner, you don't have it, you're bankrupt. You don't have what it means to get out of that debt. But the debt has been provided for you because Jesus Christ, it's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus that you can be declared righteous before God. The redemption that's in Christ is Jesus Christ paid a debt of sin. Uh, I don't know if I, it just hit me as I was saying that, the song that Sanja sings sometimes, 
is, uh, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. The Lord Jesus Christ was without sin. He didn't owe anything. But he went to a cross and he paid a debt that I couldn't pay off myself. I had a debt I couldn't pay. And he paid it for me. The redemption is in Christ Jesus. He paid for my sins. Come over with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, 25. I want, I want to show you that back in the Old Testament, uh, redemption was something real important to them because when you got in debt, financial debt, in the Old Testament, which, by the way, still happens today, although we don't call it this way, uh, you sell yourself into slavery. And, uh, and when you're in debt, you're, you're, whoever you owe money to, you owe them, you're indebted to them, and you're enslaved to them. Any money you got coming in belongs to them. You don't have freedom of deciding whether uh, how you're going to spend your money. If you owe it to someone, you must pay them. But in Bible days, when you got in debt and you got over your head, you didn't just keep adding it to a credit account. Uh, you became their slave. And you were brought into their household and you served them as a slave until your debt of sin was paid off. And, and so to be in debt, uh, you needed to be redeemed from your debt of, of bondage, uh, of financial bondage in the Old Testament. In Leviticus, it gives the right of redemption, how it is that someone who has got himself in debt and has been sold, especially in the passage I'm going to read to you, sold to a Gentile, nothing worse than for God's people to owe a Gentile money and then the Gentile become the boss, uh, the master of a Jewish person, God's people. And uh, they didn't want to see that, but yet it happened because sometimes the Gentile uh, was owed money by a Jewish person. And so God gives a law in the land of Israel of how a Jewish person enslaved in that situation can be redeemed. His freedom could be bought, his debt can be paid, and he can be freed. And, and it's called the law of redemption. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 47, it says, If a sojourner or a stranger, and that's what we mean by a Gentile, uh, a foreigner, a uh, Leviticus 25, 47, If a sojourner or a stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto, uh, unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him, either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him, of his family, may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. And so the law of redemption requires that if you're sold into slavery, now I don't see how a guy can pay off his own debt if he sold himself into slavery, but maybe an inheritance comes along and he can pay off his debt and get free, but if he don't have it to pay, then someone can pay it for him, the Bible says, who is near to kin. Someone who's a near to kin can do it for him. That is, pay off his debt and set him free from slavery. Set him free from the bondage and dominion of the Gentile that's over him, his taskmaster. And, and, and so it would take a near kinsman to do it, but also that near kinsman has to be able to do it, right? He can't just say, well, I want to set him free, but I don't have any money. So you ha not only do you have to be a near kinsman, you have to be able. And then if you're able, if you're a near kinsman and you're able... Well, then you have to be willing. No one can force a near kinsman to do it. He doesn't have to do it. No one has to step in and pay someone else's debt. So the person would have to be willing to step forward and do it. That's the law of redemption. And sure enough, God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. And the incarnation of Christ, Jesus Christ becoming a man, is for the very purpose of dying for mankind. He didn't, he didn't come as an angel he was God who came, uh, born of the Virgin Mary, and became a man for the very purpose of being a kinsman redeemer to mankind. Jesus Christ came into this world, and he became like unto us, as Hebrews says, yet without sin. And because he was without sin, then he is able to pay a debt. He could die as a substitute for me to pay for my debt of sin, and so he was able to do it. And not only was he able to do it, Jesus Christ was willing to do it because he went to the cross and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God highly exalted him, raised him from the dead, set him at his right hand to be our Savior. 
Jesus Christ be fulfilled the law of redemption, and through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, you and I could be declared righteous before a holy God. Why? He paid the debt of sin we owed. The debt of sin we owed was death, and Jesus Christ died for our sins. He did it, he did it because he was able to do it. He was sinless, and he did it because he was willing to do it, because God sent him, and, and God so loved the world, and Jesus Christ was obedient unto the Father, even to go to the cross and die for our sins. So that when we're reading over there, just that one little word, redemption, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the reason that we can be found righteous in God is not only it's found in the person of Jesus Christ, but it's also found in the work that Jesus Christ did. It's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And that is the means that you and I can be found righteous before God. Not by any works that we do, but because of what Jesus Christ did and through the payment that Jesus Christ made. Always remember the price has been paid. And Jesus Christ paid it fully. He didn't pay it halfway and let you work out the other half. His payment that he offered on that cross before God as a payment for our sins was a full payment. And you'll learn that in verse 25, but that's, we'll wait till we get to that verse to uh, explain that in more detail. Jesus Christ is the means by which, through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, we can be declared righteous before God. Now look back again to Romans chapter 3, and look at that phrase there in verse 24. It's not even a full sentence. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Backing up, we come to that phrase, by his grace. And, and when you read a pronoun like his there, it's important for you to get figure out who the his. His grace. Well, look again to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of who? God. Being justified freely by his grace. Whose grace? God's grace. We are justified freely by God's grace, but it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. The, it's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. But it, it's through that redemption in Christ Jesus that God uh, says that, that he has declared us righteous freely by his grace. It's God's grace to us. And what grace means in your Bible, grace just simply, it's a, it's a word that means a gift. But, it, but it's a gift in the sense that, that when you read it in the Bible, it has to do with a free gift. It has to do with a gift that's given to people who don't deserve it. It's given to people who cannot earn it, who, don't, who, who should not have it by, by their own value, by their own works, by their own efforts. Grace is God's favor given freely to people who do not deserve it. And that's how grace is used in the Bible. And, 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 and the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, we don't deserve that. Being declared righteous before a holy God, us sinners, we don't deserve that. But it's given to us by God's grace through the payment that Jesus Christ made, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us, God the Father can be gracious to us. That's the point. And we do not deserve that graciousness. We don't deserve that kindness. Uh, but it is a gift from God. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and, and if you need to write it down, write it down. Uh, if you haven't memorized it, you need to memorize it. Because it's a verse that declares so clearly, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest, any man should boast. Now, in fact, I'm not comfortable quoting it. Turn to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You need to know this verse. Because when we talk about salvation being to us or being declared righteous freely by his grace, you need to realize that grace means that you don't deserve it, but it is given to you freely by God because of what Jesus Christ did, not because of what you do. And that's the, the same context of Romans chapter 3 that we're, we're studying. So you need to know Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You need to memorize it and be reminded that you don't deserve to be called righteous in God's sight. You deserve to be a sinner in God's sight. But, but you can be saved from your sins. And verse 8 says, For by grace, God's undeserved, unmerited favor toward you, by God's gift to you that you do not deserve, are ye saved through faith. And the idea here is being saved from your sins, saved from damnation because of your sins. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The salvation, you didn't earn your salvation. It's not in you, it is through the redemption that is in who? Christ Jesus. So the salvation that you have, the grace of God that, that's given to you, that saves you, is through faith. It's not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a free gift. Romans 6.23 said, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So redemption, Jesus Christ paid for it, but it's offered to us by God the Father by his grace. He, it's a gift to us from God that we do not deserve and cannot earn. If the wages of sin is death, what, do we, what have we earned? What do we deserve? We deserve death. But the gift, that's speaking about the grace that came by gift, right? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We deserve death. What have we earned? What, is our, what have we merited? Well, we, we merited uh, damnation. But God's gift to us is eternal life through Christ. Come over with me to Romans chapter 11. Now you need to get this real clear in your mind that, our, that, that us being declared righteous before God is something given to us God, by God freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Because the only way you can get God's gift is freely by God giving it to you, you cannot get it by earning it. That is, if you told God, if you said, well, God, that's wonderful what Jesus Christ did, uh, he paid that price, but, but, but I want to help out. I, I want to I wanna do my part. Well, if you're going to do your part, you're going to try to earn it, right? Well, then you're not going to get it by grace. And you know what you're going to get? <laughs> you're going to get nothing. Because you cannot earn it, you cannot deserve it, you can only get it freely by God because it's a gift from God. If you turn down the gift in order to earn it, you will not be saved. And this is what you need to see. Romans chapter 11, and here's that verse that sounds a lot like the song, at least there's a... Uh, it's something you need to know about grace and, and what grace is and what it can never be. Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 6 says, well, I'll read verse 5 with it so you can see that this speaks about the believing remnant of Israel. It says, even so, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. God chooses to save those on the basis of his grace. And, and faith is just believing God, and that's how you receive God's grace. So verse 6 says, and if by grace, if that's the basis, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. In other words, God's salvation is either by grace or it's by works. It can't be a mixture of both. Because either you work for it and earn it and deserve it and get it, or it's freely given, and you cannot earn it, you do not deserve it, but it's freely given through the redemption that's in Christ. But it can't be a mixture of, of both, because if you work, then it's no more grace. And, and if it's by grace, then it cannot no longer be works. Otherwise, how could it it'd be like the, the thing that the, the preachers do on the radio and really become a bad testimony? For a gift of $25, we'll send you this free book offer. They do that all the time. Uh, from the very time I began to listen, listen to Christian radio, did I ever get, I got s upset with such statements as that. $25 means it's not free. It costs you $25. You can do all the clever language you want. Either it's free and it don't cost anything, or it costs something, and i got to go to work and earn the money to pay for it. And then if I pay for it, I deserved it. I earned it. It's one of the two. It's either a gift or it's something you work for. And the Bible is really clear that our salvation is not of ourselves. It's not of works. It is the gift of God. We are justified freely by His grace. Undeserved, unmerited favor. Through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. There's the payment that Jesus Christ made. Grace means that God can freely give you eternal life, declare you righteous, because Jesus Christ fully paid the price of the sins. And therefore, it's absolutely free to you. 
It's, it's absolutely a gift from God. It's something that you could never earn, never deserve, but it is yours because of God's grace through the redemption that Jesus Christ made. Um, when, when, when you think of this, look at Romans chapter 15. I should, I'd probably say this a little differently, but Romans 15, and look at verse 15. It says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given me, uh, uh, the grace that is given me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. Now, I just stop there because what I want you to see, and I want you to always know, is that when you study your Bible, this salvation that's by grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus is a message that was given to the Apostle Paul. When he says, the grace given unto me, he's talking about the gospel of God's grace. The, the, the fact that God's giving salvation as a free gift through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ is a message that was given to the Apostle Paul to go and preach to the Gentiles. That's Paul's message. Prior to the Apostle Paul, you will read in the Old Testament where people had to do sacrifices in order to maintain a relationship with God and to, and to keep a fellowship with God. There is a time in which Israel, out of fellowship with God, John the Baptist called the nation of Israel to water baptism, and those who were water baptized will be benefited by their Savior who came into the world for them, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were told to do certain things. But when God turned to us Gentiles in the age of grace, it's after the cross. And with an explanation of what the cross has accomplished in our behalf, God is now declaring that salvation is free through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And that message is given to the Apostle Paul, and then he shares it with you and me. He keeps talking about the grace that's given unto him. He even says in, in uh, Galatians chapter 2, when Peter, James, and John perceived the grace given to Paul, uh, that, 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 that there was a message of grace that was given to Paul to, 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 to us. And there's where we're going to find the gospel of the grace of God in Paul's epistles. And you won't find it before that. And that causes some people to try to take the works that God gave before the cross and mix it together with the grace of God, the free gift of salvation that's after the cross, and try to come up with works and gift salvation. And you can't do that. If you do a work, then it is no more, it's no more grace. That means you're not saved by grace. And the only way you can be saved is by grace. If you try to work your way for salvation, you won't be saved. Look at Romans chapter 4. Uh, I met some people this week. I had a real good time talking to them. They were part of a, a, a nationwide ministry who in the last year made a big change. They got realizing the elders of this ministry. I mean, it's a couple hundred thousand people. But the elders of this ministry came to understand that our works do not justify us before a holy God that we can only be justified through the redemption that's in Christ. And, and from the top, they started filtering down to their smaller groups, because they're a denomination. They began to filter down to the groups that no longer do we believe that keeping the law saves, but that a person is saved by grace through faith alone. And, and I got to talk to a couple that have come to that understanding very recently, but had been in that group for a long time. In talking to them, I, I was curious if they understood that before they believed in the grace of God that they were lost. And the guy says, oh, no. He says, no, we were, we were uh, in the law. We were tithing according to the law. We were keeping all the holy days. We were eating the diets of Leviticus chapter 11. We were trying to please God by keeping his law. But, but I don't think we were lost during that time. Well, what were you believing in? You were believing by doing the tithes, by keeping the, the feast days, by, by eating the diets that you were pleasing to God in your flesh. Isn't that what he believed? And now he's come to the understanding that those things don't please God. It's what Jesus Christ did. And now believing in Jesus Christ is believing in the redemption that's in Christ. Believing is trusting what Jesus Christ did. So there had to come a time in this man's life where he stopped believing in himself and trusting his efforts to save him and decided, no, it's not of works, but only at that point did he now believe in what Jesus Christ did and trust that to save him? And he never looked at it that way. But look at Romans chapter 4 in verse 4. Now to him that worketh, 
is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Well, that's what we've been talking about. Jesus Christ paid our debt, didn't he? Through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. But if a person is going to work and try to please God by his efforts, whether he takes some, those efforts out of the Bible and tries to live by the deeds of the law, as the book of Romans is talking about, or just good works, as humanism tries to do, if he's trying to do it by his works, this verse tells him something, that to him that worketh, trying to do it on his own, by his own efforts, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. No undeserved, unmerited favor, but now you want to earn it, you want to deserve it, go ahead, you're way in debt, buddy. <laughs> You've fallen short of my glory. You're in debt. To die in debt of your sins is to die and go to hell. So as long as a person's trying to work, they got a debt to pay. But in contrast, verse 5 says, but to him that worketh not. That is the guy who says, wait a minute, I can't do it. I'm not even going to try to do it. I'm not going to work. But I'm going to believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. I'm going to believe in the grace of God that's given to me through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That I can be declared righteous because of what Jesus Christ did, not because of what I do. He's going to believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. God declares him righteous. Why? Well, that's what we're studying. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. That God's righteousness is unto all, but it's upon all them that believe. Why? being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. It's when you believe in what Jesus Christ did that God declares you righteous because it's by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ. You know, just a little side note on this is I found it real interesting. Do you know the first time grace is found in your Bible? is back in Genesis 6 when the Bible says, And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So I started looking back there in the Old Testament because of our study in John, talking about grace for grace, and you come, you come to Wednesday John class, and we'll talk about the grace that John's talking about in the book of John. But because of that, it made me study grace from the Old Testament. And it was real interesting, as I was going through the Old Testament, there's a common phrase found 18 times in the Bible from the book of Genesis until the book of Jeremiah. And it's a phrase not even found in the New Testament, but it's called, it, 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 it's a phrase, uh, uh, found grace, in the eyes of the Lord, found grace. That's what it says about Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But you know what? Whenever you read about that, the 18 times, not always in the, those 18 times is it referring to the Lord. Some people found grace in, in Pharaoh's eyes and other people's eyes. But, but when it has to do with the Lord, you know why it's said that back there in the Old Testament, that this person found grace in the eyes of the Lord? It's because it's an exception to the rule. When Noah found grace to the eyes of the Lord, it's because he's an exception. <laughs> no one else found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He's going to destroy everybody uh, by his judgment. God is going to judge the world. Only one guy has an exception. He found grace. That is, out of God's favor, out of the gift of God, God spared him, and he lived. He, had, he lived because he found favor in the eyes of the Lord by a gift from God. Noah found that. Now, so you go through the Old Testament, and that's, you know, boy, there's a few people pointed out throughout that Old Testament where it's an exception that they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But look at, look at our introduction to the book of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 5. Paul received the message of grace, didn't he? And he says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his namesake. Obedience to the faith means to believe what God said, and if you believe, you've obeyed the faith, and if you've not believed, you haven't obeyed the faith. But anyhow, it's, he says, We receive grace and apostleship for obedience of faith among all nations for his namesake, among whom ye also are the called of Jesus Christ, called, uh, no, to all that be in Rome, beloved of, God, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Any exception to the rule there? No exception to the rule. Back in the Old Testament, certain people found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Paul goes over to the Rome, to, to, to writes a letter to all that are in Rome, all who have believed on Jesus Christ, says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. You got it. You're, you're found in God's favor. You're accepted of God. You're found saved by God. 
You're, you're, you're part of the Lord. You've received, you found grace in his sight. And the reason he could write that is these people have believed the faith. That is, they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there's no, no exception now. It's unto all. God's grace, salvation, righteousness is available to everybody. It's upon all them that believe. And, and you can be found righteous in God's sight by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now go back to Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. We just got a couple more phrases to back up and catch here. It's kind of tricky doing it backwards, but uh, I just thought of it this way and decided I wanted to do it this way. Um, it says, being justified, and then it says, freely. And I put those two together. Uh, what I was looking for is phrases here. We talked about that is in Christ Jesus. Then we talked about through the redemption. Then we talked about by his grace. And now we want to understand that we're justified freely. Now that's almost like a, a redundant statement, is it not? If grace means undeserved, unmerited gift of God's favor, then to say justified freely by his grace is to repeat it twice. So that you and I, I would realize that the salvation that we have is a free gift from God. Uh, not, no strings attached. It's freely given to us. We're justified. The word justified means to, to, be, to be declared righteous. And you need to understand this in the sense of a court case. When we were studying the first three chapters, I told you, Paul was like a prosecuting attorney, going after you with everything he got, whether you're a Jew or Gentile. He condemned the Gentiles in chapters, chapter 1. He condemned the Jews in chapter 2. And he made sure that none of them have any excuse so that he came to the conclusion in verse 19. Uh, well, he came to the conclusion starting in verse 9. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. None that seeketh after God. All have gone out of the way. All together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. You come to verse 19 of chapter 3 and it says, Now we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. He did such a good job in prosecuting us that the picture is us standing before the judgment bar of God, and God is on the throne in judgment, and he's looking at you, and Paul has condemned you to the point that you can't even open your mouth when he's done. You're guilty before God, no question about it. You don't even have a plea left. So with your mouth shut and nothing to plea, Paul then tells you that the remedy is God's righteousness available to you through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And that God will declare you righteous freely by his grace through that redemption. And those who get declared righteous, according to verse 22, God's righteousness is available to everyone, but it's upon all them that believe. And so what you are is standing before God guilty, waiting for him to hammer down the gavel and declare you damned for eternity. But then you heard what Jesus Christ did, and you just simply say, I'll believe that. And soon as you believe that, God declares you righteous, freely, by his grace, through the redemption that's in Christ. To stand there guilty, ready to be damned, and then the, man, the, the gavel goes down and God says, he's justified. He's declared righteous. Well, how can he be declared righteous? Well, not only did Jesus Christ die, but that righteousness of Jesus Christ is available to you when you believe, and when you believe, that righteousness is upon the believer, is it not? You're going to learn in chapter 4 that that righteousness is put to your account, and God sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ when he sees you, and therefore God says, I declare the man righteous. Because the righteousness of God is available through what Jesus Christ did. And that righteousness is available freely. You can be declared righteous before a holy God freely, because of the redemption of Christ, by the gift of God. And, and that's what justification is, is being declared righteous before a holy God. It, it, it's being declared righteous, and, and look at Romans chapter 8. I want to show you the, the different ways that it talks about justification. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 33. It says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. <laughs> well, what a passage that is. Who can condemn you if God said, I declared you righteous? And who can lay anything to your charge 
when it's Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God making intercession in your behalf, saying, look at my hands, look at my feet, I died for that sin. It's paid for. No one can lay a charge against you. No one can condemn you when the highest judge of the universe, God himself, has declared you righteous. And he did that freely. All you did was believe Jesus Christ did the work. He paid for it. It's through his blood. Uh, look, look at, uh, uh, I'm not sure what order I got here. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. It says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justification cost something, didn't it? If it didn't cost us something, we're justified freely. But it cost the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how he paid for our sins, with his blood. We're justified freely. In fact, if you look at chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. Faith is not a work. Faith is believing what someone else did for you, and you're just going to trust him to be what God says he is, the payment for your sins, the intercessor for you, the one who died for you and rose again. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who paid for your sins, and when you believe on it, God declares you righteous freely. You're justified by faith. You're justified by God, by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're justified by God himself in these verses. Uh, we learned in chapter 3 in uh, We're justified freely in verse 24. And, and so, wherever my notes are, uh, one more place. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. Jesus Christ in his resurrection is the one who's there to maintain our standing before God is just. And it's by virtue of his resurrection that we are declared righteous. Um, we're, we're that freely by his grace. It's not by our own efforts. Um, and it takes place the moment we believe. Let me just show you one verse and then say one thing and we're closing. Come to Titus. I'd like you to see this verse. We didn't quite get everything we wanted in, but we got more time to do it if the Lord spares. Titus chapter 1. When we talk about being justified, that word freely by his grace, look at what Titus chapter 3 reminds you of in verse 5. It says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed about, uh, up on us abundantly, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Not that we have done but according to God's mercy he saved us and it's by his grace and it's through Jesus Christ that God saves us it's not our efforts we're justified freely by his grace and what I wanted to say in close is the teenagers was having a great time taking them back home the other day and, uh, and I got asking them what are they learning in their Sunday school class and Dominic is going through that book Dictionary of the Gospel and he's going over the gospel and he got to the point that everyone gets to at one point and that is, can a guy commit murder and still go to heaven? Everyone always wants to know that. I don't know if everyone's committed murder and I'm the only one who hasn't or what. But, uh, but they're always worried about the murderer, and I don't know why. Is it an excuse? Not the whatever. Anyhow. So they were discussing in the, in the teenage Sunday school class if a guy said he believed on Jesus Christ, shot a guy, as soon as he shot a guy, got run over by a truck and died, is he going to go to heaven? And the teenagers were having a hard time understanding that. And I understand why it, it, that I mean by the fact that Dominic, their teacher, declared from God's word if Christ died for their sins, the murderer is going to heaven because he believed on Jesus Christ. There are murderers in heaven. David's one. Paul's probably one. There's plenty of people who believed on Jesus Christ who are murderers. They're not murderers because they repented of their sins, because they felt sorry over their sins. It's because they believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins. That's why, they're, that's why they'd be in heaven. But I understand the problem that people have. They're looking at the great, great evil sin of murder and saying, how can God save a murderer from their sin? Especially if he did it deliberately. Especially if he had no time to say, I'm sorry. How, how could God save a murderer? But you know what the problem is? Their eyes are on the wrong thing. They're looking on the great sin 
but they're forgetting about the great payment. Who died for their sins? How righteous was the one who died for their sins? Was his death equivalent enough to pay for a murderer's sin? Well, absolutely. He's the sinless, spotless son of God himself. And the focus is on, oh, look at the great sin, but look at the great payment that was made for that sinner. And God, in his great grace, will save anyone who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as being their payment of sin. Do you believe he died for your sins? If not, you may need to make a decision right now not to trust your efforts and your works, but what Jesus Christ did on that cross as being sufficient.